couldn't van people up. I'm like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> I, I was like, you know, I thought, well, we can do that for some guys, but we'll be, we'll be losing our food by the time we get back to our room. Um, but no, but the overall, the place is really cool. It's real woodsy looking. It's not, you know, it's not too dry looking. I like, I like when I, when I figure I go to a men's thing, I like to go where it's kind of like, you feel like you're kind of in the mountains, you know? So, so that'd be cool. It's a really cool spot. It's, it'll be the first time we ever try it, but I like the, um, particularly like the sanctuary. It looks really cool. It's going to be a good spot for us. So just pray about it. It's not far. That's the one thing is, you know, um, that, that's not that far to get there. It's, you know, what is it, an hour, hour and a half at the most, depending on how you drive or whatever. But um, so anyway, just wanted to kind of mention that. We did check it out, and we, I kind of filmed Glenn on my phone to do a little talk there, a little quick thing. And so I'm going to give it to the guys and hopefully do it on the main, the main sanctuary, and you'll see Glenn uh, just asking and inviting guys to come out. So, and if you guys know anybody, man, if you guys have a bro or somebody who you just kind of wants, you know that he needs to get away, let's do it. Take him. So, all right, man, we're continuing in Genesis chapter 33, uh, and we got up to verse 17, so tonight we're going to be finishing the chapter. It's only a couple verses, uh, and I pray that, uh, you know, we can hear the Holy Spirit speak to us, so let's, uh, let's give our minds over and surrender to the Lord. And, and so, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, f- thank you Lord, for this place where we can come on a Thursday night and open our Bibles, fellowship with one another, fellowship with you, especially in a time where this world and the enemy and the distractions are so just in our face. We can come tonight, Lord, and pray that your power and your spirit and your victories in our lives will prevail tonight. Let us hear from you. Lord, we want to read this word and we want to write it, let it be written on our hearts that we would walk in this uh, life, in this journey, uh, with the empowerment of your word. So, Lord, speak to us. Let this word come alive to us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, clear our minds. We pray against uh, the attacks of the enemy, as he just so wants to distract and steal the peace that you give to us. So we commit and surrender ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, how many of you guys read anything from Matthew Henry? Yeah, okay, yeah, quite a bit of you guys. Matthew Henry said, Where we have a tent, God must have an altar. Where we have a home, God must have a church. And I like that. This is going to sort of be what we're going to see tonight. When we have a tent, somewhere where, as back in the Old Testament, the culture as we saw it was to travel and pitch a tent somewhere. And we, oh, we noticed that it was often of the patriarchs to, to put up a tent and then build an altar. But I like what he says, where you have a home, though, man, that's where you build a church. Because an altar and a church is totally different. An altar is a place back then, especially in the Old Testament, where you worship the Lord and you make sacrifice as a sort of a, uh, and you notice all the patriarchs did it as a kind of a temporary thing. Anytime they had a moment, anytime they rested their head, or anytime God spoke to them, they, they built an altar. But see, to, to, to say this is my home now, this is where I'm going to call the place I'm going to live. This is where I'm going to spend my days, where I'm going to rest my head, where I'm going to get strength for the day, and where I'm going to establish a family. Well, there, there is where you want to have a church now, a full-on, you know, not only where we just make sacrifice, but this is where, this is where it all happens. This is where I find my sanctuary with God. Our reading tonight starts off when we left, we saw the two brothers meet and have a happy reunion. You guys remember that? Uh, It was God's will to protect Jacob from the destructive hand of Esau. Uh, And we talked about God's intervening will, his intervening power, you know, because Esau's intent was to kill the dude. That was his back. The the last we heard of Esau, the last words that came came out of his mouth was, I'm going to kill my brother. (laughs) And so now here we see when they had this reunion, Jacob was full of fear for obvious reasons because he knew his brother wanted to kill him. And we see an entirely different thing happening when they meet. We see Esau and Jacob coming together. And in fact, we see Esau embracing him. And we know that that wasn't anything to do with Esau. That was God's intervening hand for Jacob. 
And then so as Esau was saying, hey, all right, man, well, let's go together. I'll follow you or I'll provide you with some guys to back you up. Jacob's like, nah, I'm good. I'll, I'll you know, stay way behind you or whatever. And the Bible tells us, as we read last time in verse 16, that Esau returned that day on his way to Seir or Edom. And that's where Esau begins his life. And that's why we see next out of Esau the lineages and the, and the genealogies that he has as the Edomites and so on and so forth, down to the Agagites and everything else. <clears throat> and so that now is the line of Esau. But Jacob's like, I'm not going over there, man. So we got to commend Jacob a little bit because at least he didn't go to Edom. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But now we're going to get into where he did go, where now Jacob is headed after he has this intervening hand of God, and he's going to, he receives it, and it says down verse 17, it says, <clears throat> and Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth. So he didn't go to Edom, and as a matter of fact, if you, if you remember the reading last time, he told his brother, I'll be right behind you. I'll go to Edom. So he kind of gave him a little like, you know, I'm not really going, I'm going to go, but I'm not really going. So he goes to Sukkoth. <clears throat> now, Sukkoth means in, in the language here, it translates to mean tent town. All right? Tent town, meaning it's a passerby or town. It's on, the, it's on the wrong side of the Jordan. And I say wrong side in comparison to the promised land. There's the promised land on this side, Jordan, and then there's the wrong side on this side, Jordan. In fact, it's where Manasseh and the half, uh, half tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, develop themselves there later on. It's on the, the side where God doesn't want them. He gave them this side, Jordan, the promised land existed over there. But here he is now. He doesn't go to Edom. Good call, bro. Good call. Don't go to Edom. But he goes to Sukkoth. And knowing now that he's on the wrong side of the Jordan, he's not exactly in the promised land where he should be. It says now next, the Bible tells us that he builds him a house there in Tent Town, you see, where this was only meant to be a passerby or city. This city was there only for him to go through in order to get to where God wants him to be. And instead of him continuing on his journey over the Jordan River to the promised land at this point, he decides to stop. And then not just build an altar as a passerby, as somebody who, as he's done in the past, as a matter of fact, when he was in Bethel, just say, hey, God met me here, I'm going to build an altar. Instead, he, he says, I'm going to stop here, and I'm not just stopping for a little bit. I'm going to build a house right here. And it tells us, and look, at he made booths for his cattle. In other words, he became a farmer there. He begins to develop his life here, right, right where... So close to the promised land, but yet so far in his mind and in his heart, he's not there. So it says, therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. Now, what, what gets a man, okay? Well, I, I, just, I, just, I ask myself this all the time when I read stuff like this. Um, as a matter of fact, we were just in, the, in, in before we come out, and the, the study, the leadership, we pray and we see what the Lord's speaking to us about. And one thing we, we were talking about is a, a chapter of this book, and I always I recommend it for everybody to read. All of us are reading it as leadership in the men's study. It's The Saving Life of Christ by Ian Thomas. I, I even recommend it in the main sanctuary every time I've taught there. Um, and there's a chapter called uh, uh, A Day to Remember, okay? And it's all about uh, remembering the children of Israel uh, remembering the day they were delivered from Egypt. That's the, the, whole, the whole theme of the chapter. But what it is, is it's talking about how they did not remember, okay, how, how it seemed so far in their past, this day that God took them from being slaves for 400 years, okay, 400 years under bondage to the Egyptian people. And God delivers them. And not only does he deliver them, he takes them right out to an ocean or a sea, and he opens it for them. And they walk through it on the dry land. And then not only that, it wasn't like something where he left it open and they were like, wow, that was weird. No, he closed it on the Egyptian army as they followed them. To, to, in other words, this kind of stamp that I just set you, got, not only did I set you free from Egypt, I also destroyed your enemy, drowned them all right behind you. I was telling the guys, I go, I remember, and I probably told this story, but 
I remember when I was a young Christian, it might have been my first year, I was uh, reading my Bible at home. I was reading the book of Hebrews. It was the first book I decided to read as a believer. And I had a, I used to always have flowers and stuff around my house, just kind of into that stuff. And uh, it was dying on my table. And I said, God, if you're really real, can you make this flower turn to life again? You know, resurrect this flower, man. I'll believe in you forever. I, I swear, if you do that, I'm going to be like, God is so real, right? Of course, nothing happened to my flower. But I, I think, I look at the children of Israel, and I'm like, they just saw the ocean open, man, and close. Like, what else do you need to believe in God, right? If, if you go out to Long Beach before the break wall, and, you're, and God decides to split the ocean open for you, are you going to, like, maybe two weeks later go, oh, I don't know, man, I'm struggling. I don't know if the Lord exists or not. After, after over the ports over there, he opens the ocean. And, I, and I'm saying this because the chapter speaks of remembering this day. And, of course, we start getting into, well, that, that is similar to a lot of our victories. The day God set us free. Uh, we used to be all, some of us were in the streets. Some of us were on drugs. Some of us were just in bondage. Some of us, we are just lost. And we actually had nowhere to go. And, and we, we came to the Lord, and he set us free and gave us a new mind, a new life, a new purpose. And we go, gosh, man, I'm rejuvenated in this life. God gave me purpose. He gave me life. He gave me, for me, he gave me a lot. He gave me a wife. He gave me kids. He gave me a future. He gave me all, because I had nothing. I had nothing when I came to the Lord. I was just by myself, nothing. And, and you think back to those days, and you say, man, that was powerful. It's a miracle. As some of you who know yourself more than anybody else, it was a real miracle. You're like, you guys don't know. I don't talk much about it, but trust me, it was a miracle that God saved me. <laughs> you know? And you know, and you remember that. But why is it that a day could go by and we forget? All of a sudden, we're, we're weak and powerless. I was sharing with the guys, and I'll share with you guys. I struggle with sleep a lot. I have a hard time sleeping. And I believe part of it's spiritual. I don't know if it's insomnia or whatever, but without sleeping, it really screws your mind up, <laughs> okay? After a while, you're like, I just want to sleep for five hours, you know? So I could, I could at least think straight. You know, I don't even know what color that my jacket is right now. Uh, and, and, you know, and so each night I, I have this fear, like, God, I'm, I'm not going to be able to sleep, man. Uh, and, but I was telling them, I was sharing this with them because I'm like, last night I slept. And I woke up, and I'm like, honey, I slept. You know, I had to use some headphones and all this, but I slept, you know, and, and I was like, that was so awesome. Praise the Lord. I slept a whole night. And then, but here I am tonight before the study, I'm coming. I'm going, oh, I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight. This is going to suck, man. I'm not going to have a good night tonight. Already. This was just yesterday. You know, like, how is it that, like, the enemy can just get so in front of your mind that you're so distracted from these victories? The ocean just opened for them. But the dry heat of the wilderness, the rocks, the irritating, all they did remember in the wilderness was the onions and the leeks and the vegetables of Egypt. You remember? They said, oh, remember the leeks and the onions we used to eat back in Egypt. They weren't like, remember we just saw the ocean open up with a big hurricane of fire behind it? You remember all that? No, they didn't say that. Oh, I remember the onions, you know. What? What's wrong with these people? But here I am. The same way. So distracted. So caught up in, in the now. And, and the enemy plays in the now. When we need to get our minds shifted and resting in the victories and the power of God. Jacob, bro. Jacob. You just saw God move in your life. You were just so afraid that your brother was going to kill you because he had 400 men. And instead of you just marching right over that Jordan and going right past the Jordan into the promised land that you're supposed to be in, you stop here in Sukkoth. And not only do you just stop there, you plant your house there. What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> Come on. Don't you remember, Jacob, in Genesis chapter 28? And I'll just read it. You can jot it down or you probably have it already. Genesis 28. Verse 18, it said, uh, it says, uh, and Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took a stone that he had put for his pillows and set up a pillar and poured oil on it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, 
But the name of that city was called Luz at first. And Jacob, notice verse 20, vowed a vow saying, God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and a raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give a tenth unto thee. Jacob knew where he was supposed to go. He knew where God was going to call him back to. He had it already written. He vowed to before God, this is where it's going to go down. Right here in Bethel is where I'm coming back. Well, never mind. I'm going to stop in Sukkoth first. What? Like, you knew what you said. You knew what the power that's behind you. But, you know, I'm saying, guys, I'm kind of blowing this up because I don't blame them. Because I know what it's like to be distracted. I know what it's like to all of a sudden be, be, you're walking straight and forward and you know exactly where you're going and you know exactly what God has spoken to you about, but you sometimes do stop in Sukkoth and you build your house right there instead of building it where you know you're supposed to go. And this is the, the trickery of Satan. So clever, so good to use. And I, and I picture the children of Israel, again, back to that story in the wilderness. How powerful the senses are, aren't they? Our, our senses, they're so powerful. Feeling, touching, smelling, seeing the nerve endings on our fingers. They're so powerful because in that dry heat on the rocks of the wilderness, uh, no, no, you know, they were out in the wilderness. It was enough to make them forget everything that God had did. And our human nature is to be a lot of times guided and dictated and moved by our senses. If it don't feel good, you don't touch it. You don't eat it if it doesn't taste good. If it's hot, you stay away from it. And so Satan knows that our senses, as man, they're driven and by, by how things are, are in front of us. And they, they can actually dictate what we do up here. And eventually down here in the heart. And so, yes, for Jacob, it was probably very convenient to not have to deal with the Jordan River. And so he decided to stay here and build a house now. He said this in his mind, guys. This is what he's saying in this verse. I know I'm not supposed to be here. This is only temporary. I know that I'm supposed to go to Bethel. I know where I'm supposed to go. I already vowed to God where I'm going back home. I'm on my way. And God's getting me there too. But you know what? I'm going to go ahead and start a life here for a minute. I'm going to go ahead and think I can pull it off here. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and build booths for my animals, and I'm going to go ahead and become a farmer. I'm going to live here with all my family, too, right here in Sukkoth, on the other side, the wrong side of the Jordan. See, this is where we have to be careful, because if the enemy can convince you enough to not keep pursuing that victory that Jesus has for us, and he says, you know, you're fine right here. You're struggling a little bit. Yeah, it's okay. Build your house in your struggle. Oh, oh, you're, 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 you're bored in the Lord. That's okay. Just, just plant yourself right there in that boredness that you have. No need to try to get out of it. No need to try to get out of it. Oh, you're struggling, you say. Temptation, maybe. You know what? That's okay. Put your family right in the middle of it. You guys will be fine. What? I've done this. What do you mean? Put my family right in the middle. No, my family's coming with me where God says we're supposed to be going, to the promised land. On the other side, Jordan, I'm not going to stop here and build my sanctuary in the middle of a place I'm not supposed to be. But how often do we do what Jacob's doing? We say, you know what? I'm going to stop here. And this is where I'm going to plant myself. The only thing we do, guys, is we do what the children of Israel did in Deuteronomy chapter 1. When we do this, here's what happens. When we find ourselves sort of just saying, this is good enough. I know it's not really where God wants me to be, but you know it's good enough. Guess what we do? We find ourselves on Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb is described in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 6. And what God says to the children of Israel is this. Get off this mountain. You're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be in that land over there. See, but Mount Horeb was an interesting, ge geogra it was placed interesting, you know, geographically. Why? Because Mount Horeb was, was good enough to see the land, but it, and it was also good enough to see Mount Sinai, where God was. So it was right in the middle of both. And it was good enough for them to say, I know where God's at, and I don't know where I'm supposed to be going, but I'm fine right here. 
Because I got God and I got the promise kind of over here, but I'm okay right here because we're surviving. And God says to them on Mount Horeb, get down this mountain. What are you doing? I never called you to live here on this mountain. I called you to go to the promised land. See, but like the children of Israel, we too, we seek God close enough in our lives to be miserable. And then we see the promised land far enough, or at least in front of us, the victory that Jesus has for all of us. We know it's there. But we say, you know, man, I just, I just can't do all that. I don't know how to surrender fully. I don't know how to, how to really give that up. Or I can't really give this up. Man, this will affect my whole life. And we have our, our reasons. And we become the Christian living in the wilderness. The one who is just living in the dry, man. That's it. And we don't actually... Possess that power. Now, there's two people here I'm discussing and describing, okay? The one guy is the one that Satan's nailing. And he's, and, he's, and he's messing with you. He's lying to you. You need to say, I rebuke thee, Satan, in Jesus' name. Uh, Lord Jesus, I pray you would uh, take this fiery dart away from me. Lord, and as you expelled Satan in front of you by your word, I'm going to do the same. But the other guy, that's one, that's one of the guys that could be on Mount Horeb and in Sukkoth. But the other guy is the one that just don't want to. <laughs> I'm okay out here in the wilderness, you know what I'm saying, the leeks and the onions, I remember all that, and, and I know God saved me, you know, but whatever, man, so, you know, I, I, don't want to, I don't even want to go to the Jordan, it, it, it just, it, I don't like it over there, and then that's the other guy who, who's kind of more, more willfully doing it, so there's two, there's, two, there's two guys here, the one that's just the enemy's nailing, and, and guys, and I know what that's like, that's the one we need to really, we got to continually seek the Lord Continually seek his promises and put his word in front of us so that way it can expel the enemy as Jesus did. That's one of them because we know that, uh, that we battle not with flesh and blood but with the principalities that are in dark places. That's, that's one side where the enemy gets victory because he's out to what? Do kill, steal, and destroy, the Bible says. He'll kill, he'll kill your, your, your excitement and joy. He'll steal it from you too. And that's where you find yourself in the middle of just saying, Lord, restore unto me this joy. But the other guy that's stuck here in the middle is just the one that full on just says, I don't want to keep going. <laughs> I'm good right here, man. You know, that's for a pastor or for the missionaries or whatever. I'm good. No, you're not. Don't build your home in Sukkoth on the wrong side of the Jordan. So before we go to verse 18, you have to know something very important that takes place between verse 17 and 18 that's not written in here. <laughs> and I'm not about to add to the word. Uh, but just make, take a mental note. Ten years goes by now. He stood in Sukkoth for ten years. Take note of that, because that's interesting. He was there for ten years before verse 18 happens. That's how long he lived there. That's how long he said, I'm good here. That's how long he kept himself from going on the other side of the Jordan. Ten years, man. It shows that we can live a long time this way. You know, this isn't, a, this isn't sometimes changed over a Bible study. You know what I'm saying? You can live this way, not in the promised land, on the wrong side of the Jordan, for a long time. <laughs> you can. That's a sad truth. And so here he is. Ten years goes by, and now verse 18. And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem. Now, just quickly, I want to make a little note on that. Shalem is not necessarily a part of the city name. A lot of the commentators in the way it reads in the original text would say, Shalem means peace, shalom, it means peace. So what it's saying is, it would read something like, he came to Shechem peacefully, okay? That's what it's saying. It's not saying he went to Shechem, a city, uh, uh, Shalem, a city of Shechem. It's really saying he went to the city of Shechem in peace. So he traveled peacefully. Okay, I, I kind of want to just throw that out there because uh, there, there really, uh, really isn't uh, the city Shalem. <laughs> okay, you won't, you won't really find it. But so, and, and read sometimes the Bible as we break it down in translation, it makes sense as we go forth. But the point of that statement is Shechem, not necessarily Shalem. Okay, now, um, so here he is peacefully going to Shechem 10 years later. Now, this is interesting. Because Shechem is on the other side of Jordan. All right? Something happened. We don't know. 
while he was farming. We don't know what went down over there in, in uh, Sukkoth in the tent city. But whatever went down, it caused Jacob to go, you know what, after 10 years, after 10 years, he's like, I better get going. <laughs> you know, it's probably time for me to go where God said I'm supposed to be. You know, it's, I, I, I should probably go. I think the Jordan's probably down a few feet. Maybe it's time to go over to cross the Jordan. And go to Shechem. All right. Uh, you remember in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6 through 7, God spoke to Abraham and said, this is the land I'm going to give to your people to your seed. So it says that it's in the land of Canaan. And by the way, when Abraham was there, there were, there were Canaanite people there too. So we know this has always been occupied by the others. All right. So he went to Shechem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram. Now watch this. And he pitched his tent before the city. He pitched his tent before the city. He pitched his tent before the city of Shechem. So what that last statement tells us, that he didn't quite go all the way in Shechem. He pitched his tent before the, toward the city. You see, like who else pitched his tent before a city? Lot. He pitched his tent the same way that Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. And the meaning behind that was because we know Lot was interested in in the, the, uh, what Sodom looked like, uh, the economy of it, the, the way it operated. And so we know that he pitched his tent towards there. It's the same way that Jacob now is pitching his tent towards Shechem where he's supposed to be. And by the way, at this time, though, Shechem isn't actually the godliest of cities. And you're gonna, we're going to find that out next chapter. But either way, nonetheless, here's Jacob now saying, instead of continuing to go, to where I'm supposed to go. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop here and just kind of note that it's a far off. Look, mistake one 10 years ago was him not going at all and planning a house where he wasn't even supposed to be. Mistake two, getting closer to where he's supposed to go, but not going fully in it and only pitching a tent. Now notice, he built a house in Sukkoth where he wasn't supposed to be. But here now he's getting closer where he's supposed to be, and he pitches a tent instead. Kind of doing the backwards right here. Kind of doing the back. I would think we would have been somewhat satisfied if we were to read he put a tent in Sukkoth and maybe pitched his tent. I, I built a house near Shechem. I would have been like, well, he's getting there. He's getting a little closer to where he's supposed to be. But that's not the case. He pitches a tent there towards the city. You know, I don't know what it is about us that, that keeps us from fully living in the victory that Christ has for us. I don't know. I don't know what it is about me. If it was a math problem, it'd be done. If it was a solution to it, a formula to it, I, I think all of us would have memorized it and figured it out. It'd be done. We would say, this is... You know, you know, one plus one equals living victory at Jesus Christ all day long. <laughs> Done, you know. But here is an example of a man who's on this journey, man. Journey, going, going through this walk, leaving Laban's. And we got to remember all the stuff he's gone through, right? Finding the ugly wife, finding the pretty wife, living there for 14 years, having all these kids, walking through, uh, you know, arguing and manipulating and deceiving Laban, the whole story, meeting his brother, fear of his life, God delivers him, stops in Sukkoth. I mean, here's this guy walking this journey, honestly, like all of us are walking today. Honestly, making mistakes, having ups and downs, highs and lows, experiencing God and then sometimes not. Remember, he just wrestled with God. I mean, he's not a... Uh, his spiritual life is not insignificant, by the way. Jacob has a deep spiritual life. The Jacob we know here in this text has a very deep spiritual life. Not too many people wrestle with God one-on-one -on -one and get their hip broken, you see. He has a very personal relationship with God here in our reading tonight. But yet he's still making these mistakes. You know what that tells me, man? It's okay to make mistakes, first of all, okay? Because you're gonna. You're gonna make mistakes. If it was that simple, the day we got saved, and then the following day we were to live in the victories of Jesus Christ for the rest of our life, then we probably wouldn't need most of this. It'd be done. It'd be a done deal. 
you know, uh, uh, Peter, <laughs> the disciple. Uh, Jesus would have never even told him a story about the rooster or whatever. He would have just said, you're going to always follow me and love me until the end, Peter. No, Jesus didn't say that. He said, oh, you love me so much, but let me tell you, you're going to deny me pretty soon. By the way, <laughs> sorry, it doesn't, it's just not that easy. Now, I envy Paul, and no, I don't, because <laughs> the dude got his head cut off according to tradition. But his confirmation and transformation happened pretty quick. I mean, but then again, he got blind, and all kind of, I can't imagine that happening, right? Never mind, I don't envy him, all right? Uh, take that back, delete it off the video. Uh, but his conversion supposedly to a lot of people today, we believe it was a fast one. You know, he, he had these revelations given to him by Jesus. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, because of the revelations given to me, I suffer these afflictions. So he got it all, man, all in one shot, you know. But then again, his life was miserable physically, okay? <laughs> he was in prison. Tore, I mean, we, we can go down the list. Um, point is, is we don't get it all the first day. We don't go from, from gutter to promised land overnight. We don't. Unfortunately, we don't. We go from gutter to promised land in this journey called life. And, on that, and in this journey, we experience so many things, man. We have, we have so much uh, uh, battlefronts spiritually that we all have to experience and that are, that, are, that are there. Every one of us in this room tonight have some kind of battlefront in front of us, whether it's personal, mental, spiritual, psychological, uh, physical, whatever it is. We all have one. We do because that's life. And yes, we're Christians at the same time. <laughs> you see the craziness of that? And yes, we're on the road to victory at the same time. Some of you... Live in victory tonight. I personally don't know if it's something that you attain once and for all in this life. I think it's something we attain and experience uh, frequently. I think we're going to experience victories often. The same way that we're going to experience failure. But we have to be careful to not allow that to uh, build this perception that you're a failure as a Christian. <laughs> Jesus made it this way. That we would constantly live and grow and draw ourselves closer to him by way of affliction. In this world, we're going to have tri tribulations, he said. But he said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome this world. But for us, it didn't stop there. You see, Galatians 2.20, my favorite scripture. You know, we no longer live. We don't live anymore, yet he lives in us. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. This is a continual thing. We have to tell ourselves, today, Lord, I need to live in that victory. I need to live in victory today, Lord. I, I need a word from you. I need the word because this is our daily bread. How about, how about the washing of the feet? See, I love that picture because Jesus told Peter, he said, after Peter said, no, you ain't washing my feet, Lord. <laughs> That's a servant's job. Jesus said to him, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. Peter then said, like all of us would say, well, then wash my whole body, <laughs> you know, wash my head and my feet and everything then. That's exactly what he says. And Jesus says, oh, Peter, you don't get it. Once you bathe yourself once, your whole body's clean. It's just your feet that have to get washed afterward. And what he's telling him is, listen, he's telling him this. You're clean once, man, but you'll need your feet washed continually. Let me do that for you daily. Let me wash your feet daily. Sure, you're clean. Sure, you're, you're stamped with my mark on your head. You are going to heaven. You are going to spend eternity with me, yes, but you need to wash your feet every day because they get dirty. And I love that lesson he taught Peter. And Peter would know that very personally afterward because he would deny the Lord. You see, he would, he would experience this stuff and he would say, oh, that's what he meant. Oh, Lord, wash my feet then again. We got to find ourselves understanding this because... This is when your walk becomes personal with him. <laughs> Daily, now all of a sudden. We don't need to every day. Lord, I repent. Uh, forgive me my sins. I, I, I need somebody to tell me the sinner's prayer again this morning. No. No, he, he's saying, you're saved. But let's spend some time together today. Let me wash your feet. Let me get personal. Let, let, let me deal with some of the things that maybe are on you that you just, we need to, we need to wipe away. 
So Jacob, verse 19, it says, And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor. Oh, here we go. Shechem's father for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar. So here he's doing the altar thing, okay? He, instead of building a house, but, but then again, he shouldn't build a house because he's not fully in the, the city yet, as I explained earlier. So he's building an altar, and he called it El El Ohi Israel. Now that's interesting. One thing about Jacob, man, I could say, is he's starting to understand who he is. The word there that he named it means the God, the God of Israel. This is the first time we hear Jacob referring to himself in his new name that God gave to him when he wrestled with him. You guys remember? You will no longer be called Jacob, but now you will be called Israel. And so Jacob now is saying, I'm getting closer, but I recognize one thing, that God is my God. You see, he's the God of Israel. He's, he's saying, uh, he's my God. He, he governs me. He governs me. See, he didn't lose that. He didn't lose that. He, just because he's getting mixed up and finding himself comfortable and maybe finding himself compromising a little bit and maybe finding himself not exactly where he should be, how many of you can say amen to that? I don't always find myself right where I need to be. I don't always find myself uh, perfect with God. I don't always find myself exactly where he wants me. Almost, almost every day I feel that way, okay? But I know who my God is. And that's one thing Satan can't take away from me. I know who he is. And because of that, man, because we know who the Lord is, because we can recognize that, because we can say, I might be a failure, but I know I'm forgiven, that's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us walking forward and not stopping there and not just saying, that's it, man. Because if you find yourself in a place of going, you know, sometimes I come to Bible study and all I feel like is I'm not really where I need to be, and say you stop, that's where the enemy has victory. And that's where God is not your God. You're not claiming him as your God. Look, though I struggle, and though I struggle, I have temptations, I have struggles, I have mental warfare, spiritual warfare, physical battles. Though I struggle, I know who God is, and the enemy can't change that. The other night, I'm struggling with something, and I tell the Lord, well, guess what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do communion with my kids tonight, whether I'm messed up or not. I, I, I'm like talking to myself. You, you see, if you follow me around, yeah, I, look, I look pretty weird, man. I talk to myself. I, 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 I argue with myself. I, I do all these things. I, I sometimes think if somebody was to see that, man, my wife's going to be like, you really are not okay, you know? Yeah. You, you really are losing it. And one time I think she heard me. I'm like, nothing, nothing. I, don't, I didn't say nothing. <laughs> She's like, what? I'm like, nothing, nothing. I was over here talking to myself all loud. See, but I said, No. I said, then, Lord, I will teach my kids about you tonight and have communion no matter if I'm messed up or not. I don't care. Because guess what? I'm going to be messed up no matter what. My body, our bodies, our minds, they're decaying today. They are. They're falling apart on every single one of us in this room, some of us more than others right now. Okay? That's no joke. And guess what? It's only going to get worse. I don't care if you're able to be you know, uh, 30, 40, I'm all into working out. I go to UFC gym. I'm not lying. My dad's a crazy workout freak, man. I got to keep up to him. But guess what? It's all going to fall apart eventually. It's all going to die. We're, we're, we're designed to, to have a stop button, and it's going to be hit one day. But guess what? The God in heaven, Jesus Christ, he's my God, and he's my Savior. And that don't change. So, though I might sometimes find myself in Sukkoth, not fully crossing that Jordan today, honestly, I, I might not be able to cross the Jordan. I don't know. I want to. Uh, I might find myself struggling sometimes. I even might find myself putting an altar where I shouldn't even be putting an altar in my life. But you know what? I do know one thing, man. Jesus is my Savior. And I'm learning that he loves me. I'm learning that. I've been walking with the Lord for 15 years. And I think I'm just learning that he loves me. <laughs> and that he cares for me. Because he says, 
Cast your cares upon me, for I care for you. And he says, I will love you to the end. And I think I'm just catching that, that he actually loves me. And that's okay, because I will walk out of here saying, though I might still be learning a lot of lessons maybe some people have learned already and they know or whatever, God is my God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's not going to change. That's why he says it. El El Ohil Israel. The God, the God of Israel. He's recognizing it even in the places where he knows he will eventually leave. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, you, know, you know, as we see the patriarchs, they're for our examples to learn from. And as we see Jacob tonight putting himself in a place, Lord, I always think of the things that, you know, Pastor Jeff says a lot to me and to the body. Um, God puts you in a fix to fix you. And, Lord, we know that you put us in these situations at times. It's to fix us. It's to, to, for us to grow. It's for us to grow. And, and to have victories continually. To get us to say, you know, um, yes, we think sometimes in the wilderness about Egypt. Um, Yes, we sometimes forget that you open the ocean, even in our lives. Uh, Lord, but we are saying tonight, the reason we're here and the word that we receive ignites us and illuminates us to say, I may have forgotten, I may be thinking of Egypt too much, but Lord, tonight I want the promise on my mind. You are my God. You are my Savior. You are my victory. And so, Lord, no matter what the enemy has put in front of me today as a cloud, Lord, remove it in Jesus' name and let your word prevail and let the promises of your word be those things that, that we solidify in our minds tonight, that the Jordan River is just over there and we keep going. We keep going because we know that you died, yes, but you rose again to live, to live in us. So we pray, Lord, that victory that you provided, that's not attained by any self uh, Anything that we can do, you provided it already. Help us then to shift gears mentally and spiritually and physically to say, then we live in your victory, rest in your, your victory, because we're only going to be more than a conqueror through you, not through us. So, Lord, write these things on our hearts tonight. Go before our fellowship that you would be with us. Lord, strengthen us continually this night. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.